This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles, on the Rockstar Radio Network. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd on the Rockstar Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, hello. Welcome to this edition of your Guide to Book Publishing. We have a special treat. Usually we have multiple guests on, and I wanted to focus today on someone who I have known for years and years, have worked with in a a multiple of uh, hats that we have both worn in in and out of the publishing community. And we're going to talk about fiction. But for my nonfiction listeners, don't turn off because everything in strategy that involved in marketing, which we're going to get into in our second half, is it, it really reflects directly on nonfiction because the truth be told, and what my guest is going to share is they cross over all the time. And with me the, this, this afternoon is Mara Pearl. Marl is the author of the popular Milford Haven novels. They've earned over 15 literary awards nationally and internationally. The saga is based on her BBC radio drama, which had in excess of 4 million UK listeners every week. She's a dynamic force and voice in women's fiction. She speaks nationally on creativity and personal transformation. And she's an accomplished audiobook performer. She was an actress on Days of Our Lives and a journalist for the AP, Rolling Stone, and the Financial Times of London. And what we're going to be talking about during this first segment is really looking about the development of ideas and fiction and where they came from. I've already given you a hint that she had a very popular series in the BBCs. So with that, welcome, Mara, to our show. Thank you so much, Judith. Lovely to be here. Yes, and so let's let's talk about what happened with the Milford Haven novels and certainly the latest book that you have just birthed because we, we don't want to leave our hour without getting into what the heart knows as well. Well, thank you. It has been um, an interesting saga, I can finally say that I'm an overnight success after 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Mara, I remember when I finally was on, the, I had a cover story on People Magazine and a four-page spread on one of my books dealing with sabotage and conflict in the workplace. And I, I had a meeting planner call me and said, oh, my God, you're an overnight success. Do you know how many bloody years it gets to get to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So let's talk about this overnight success. Yes. Um, I wouldn't want to mislead people to think it can be just a a 10-minute process. You think of an idea, you write it down, and suddenly you're a national bestseller. It has happened sometimes, although, to be honest, I'm not sure I envy those people to whom it has happened because readiness is everything, Uh, and there's so much to, to do to really support an ongoing series. So in a nutshell... I was a, an actress on a soap opera, but I also had a background as a writer, and I was used to doing a lot of research for my writing. These two forces within me combined, and I created a radio drama. It became uh, a huge hit, surprisingly, not in our own country, but overseas. That eventually led to interest in writing novels based on that drama, and the novel process itself has been concurrent with huge shifts in the publishing business that you and I know about so much, so well. So I've had to ride a sort of bucking bronco to get these books to their readers. But again, I would say I've learned so much along the way that I really cherish the path. So where I am now is I'm with a large New York publisher, and my first hardcover debuted in October. It is steadily building audience. Uh, I have 
done two interesting little short stories as e-books on Kindle, each of which became a bestseller. So gradually, the series is taking hold, and this will be a series of 12 novels. And so the, the well, you've you've had publications with that some are out, and now you're going back and revisiting them. So talk a little bit about that, the twist and turns there. Yes. Okay. So here's the thing: I had a lot of experience with all forms of drama. I grew up in a theatrical family. My sister is Linda Pearl, who's a well-known actress. My father was a graduate of Yale Drama School. When I was a child. You know, the hearth in front of the fireplace? Well, I thought it was a stage. So I did a show every night, and I thought everyone did. So that was, <laughs> you know, that was life to me. So I produced my own little shows. Um, I got a job uh, as a regular on a television series when I was a child. So performing dialogue and also writing dialogue was really my thing. And... When I got a job on Days of Our Lives, which I absolutely adored, I fell in love with this soap opera format, which is a longer form of storytelling, and it has certain things that, are, that must be part of that form, one of which is multiple storylines, and one of which is multi-generational storytelling. So that appealed to me very much. Okay, so, meanwhile, I had spent the summer in a tiny town on the central coast of California. Now, I had lived in three places in my life, Tokyo, where I grew up, 11 million, then New York City, and then Los Angeles. So what did I know about a little town? Absolutely nothing. But it spoke to my soul. It spoke to my heart. And I listened to that. And this idea, as I was working every day on Days of Our Lives, I began to think, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to create a soap opera based on that little town where I spent the summer performing? So that's how the idea germinated, and it really became a big hit as a radio drama in the States, in local markets, and then in, throughout the U.K. So while it was on the air in London and getting a lot of attention, uh, I was approached by a number of publishers. And so I took meetings, and the best offer came from Random House. And so we were really on the process of signing that contract. Well, a very interesting twist uh, in the road came along. One of the editors who was making this offer from Random House, and of course an American company, but this was in the London office, she said, listen, big changes are coming in publishing. We, Random House and all of its affiliates, are about to be purchased by a company called Bertelsmann, which is a huge German publishing conglomerate. And we don't know if we'll even have jobs when this happens. And we can't guarantee that the new management will care about projects we have signed contracts for. So the risk is your Milford Haven project could get sidelined, stuck in a warehouse, and we would own it forever. You could never get it back. So her recommendation was that I not sign that contract. I paced the floor all night in London, and the next day I decided not to sign that contract. Everything this person warned me about did come to pass. I'm sure that my project would have been warehoused, and I'd never have gotten it out. But here's the thing. By the time this happened, the press had already been reporting that I was going to do novels based on the radio drama. So now I had four and a half million people saying, well, when is book one? <laughs> so I really had to get rolling with this. Well, here I was, good at writing dialogue, but what did I really know about writing a novel? I honestly didn't know anything about writing a novel. Now I understand how little I knew. I plunged in, but I was very glad that I had, let's say, a smaller stage to begin this because I co-founded a tiny little press with about 10 other professionals, each of us. There were three other authors, and then there were publishers, editors, designers, and so forth. So it was a wonderful group of professionals. But 
to be honest, that first early edition, and we only printed like a hundred of these just to use as test marketing so that I could get some feedback and begin to learn what I didn't know. That first manuscript was dialogue, 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 and a little bit of description, and then dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. It wasn't much different from a script. Well, that's not a novel. A novel has to have narrative voice, a real point of view, themes, inner conversations for characters, so many elements that I really had to study and learn about and tune into. Now, I had studied literature, so I recognized a good novel when I saw one, but that's different from being able to really create one. So I allowed myself time and I worked with mentors, and I read and read and wrote and rewrote and rewrote. So finally, I felt I was ready to produce the series in earnest, and book one was published in 2005. And it was published by this small press, and it had a lovely cover, and it was well-written, and it won a couple of awards. So I felt that I was on track. But um, there are two parts to the whole fiction process, Judith. There's the solitary aspect of being in your office and relentlessly writing and rewriting and doing your research and structuring your story and figuring out the arc of each character and so forth. And I I love that process. But that's maybe 50% of it. The other 50% is a very external process. It's like a dialogue between you and your readers. Well, if you're going to have a dialogue, you have to find out who are your readers. No, the, the magic potent comes, to, it comes up. It rears its head. Yes, yes. And, of course, then you start getting into the aspect of marketing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Mm-hmm. You know, Mara, one you said something that is so critical, and I hope our listeners picked it up. You didn't rush to publish. If there is one of the single biggest mistakes I see with the authors that I've worked with in my book shepherding cap, as as someone who runs Author You and I've run other publishing organizations, is that they get this idea and they start rushing and they they don't get it. So when we get back, let's talk more about some of that process. And, and we'll, we'll see that. So we have, we have a couple of minutes. We're going to thank some of the people who are involved with our sponsoring. And we'll be back with Mara with much more insight into this process of creating a book that sells and becomes a bestseller and really brands you. Right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Is there a book in you or another? Author You will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good. If you already have a book out, you'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author You brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author You's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author You is for you. If you're a hobbyist or a casual author it's not join author you today through its website at author you.org follow author you on twitter at author you and on facebook at author you where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily author you where the author goes to become seriously successful every picture tells a story And it's a truism that people do judge a book by its cover. Nick Selinger and NZ Graphics have been in the business of producing superior graphic cover design and interior layout for self-published authors, independent and traditional publishers for years. He has developed a reputation for excellent work, fast turnarounds, and best of all, affordable pricing. NZ Graphics also produces e-books and 
book marketing materials such as posters, sell sheets, postcards, bookmarks, business cards, logos, and more. Books designed for his clients have won multiple book awards, including Best Book Award by U.S. Book News, multiple Evy Awards from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Indie Book Awards, the San Francisco Book Festival Award, and Freedom Medal Award from Valley Forge. Visit www.nzgraphics.com or call 303-985-4174 for more details about making your book the success it should be. Mention that you are an FOJ, friend of Judith's, and that you heard about NZ Graphics on your guide to book publishing. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Right, so as we exited a couple of minutes, minutes ago, we were talking about the not rushing to publish, which Mara did not do, which is just so smart. Wouldn't you say, Mara, that's one of the problems that you encounter too? Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you, Judith. And it's so tempting, particularly oh. these days, because in olden days, you know, you had no choice. You had to wait for a publisher to pick you up, and they handled the printing, the distribution, and so forth. Now, there are so many options with all the technologies we have, and so many services have sprung up with promises of, we'll do your book professionally and so forth. Well, that's fine, but let's focus on the interior of the book first of all. I'll never forget one of our, yours and my favorite people is John Kramer, fantastic, you know, guru of book marketing. And at one of the first times I ever heard John speak, he said with his impish smile, you know, if your book isn't good, they're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they will because the average book gets slammed on page 18. Oh, you bet. People and, discard them and, and much worse. They damage your reputation in various online forums. Mm -hmm. And once those mm -hmm. damning reviews are out there, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. You know, you might get a bad review even if you have a fabulous book. There's no guarantee about that. But let's say that to create the kind of book and the kind of life and career that you really want, you must declare and choose absolute commitment to excellence. Well, and that is bottom line. And the excellence is the interior, the content. Is it a great story? Is it entertaining? Especially for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember when I read your first book, I called you and I said, so what happens? <laughs> what happens? And you said, clever author you, said, well, wait till you can get the next book. Well, she's. I know. Well, yeah, I learned that. I learned that from Louis L'Amour. Yeah. Louis was one of my wonderful mentors in life. And I asked him one of those. I said, Louie, what happened? And he said, well, dear, you're just going to have to wait and yes. read the end of the book. And I thought, oh, he is so smart. And I just I decided right then and there, I have to stand up for my storytelling. Yep. And for, and for fiction people and authors that I work with, I, I am especially when there is another book. that at, And usually once we're well into the development of the book, into publication, that they're well into moving into that next book or even another book. Mm -hmm. That it seems to me as a marketing strategy is that you include that chapter, even though it might be tweaked. Uh, an mm -hmm. opening chapter to tease them. You're seeing a lot of the big, big authors do that. So that you know it's coming, they can hardly wait mm -hmm. um, and grab that book. But Yes, I do that with each of my books, too. I have a prologue and a first chapter of mm -hmm. the subsequent book printed at the end of the book that you're reading. So mm -hmm. you know that it's real. I haven't just pretended that maybe someday I'll write the next book. I am writing the next book, and it will be coming out, and you'll be able to continue with that story. 
step. And, and that's, that's really one of the successes of a good fiction writer. And for a nonfiction writer, that uh, I, I know when I wrote my very first book, and it was published in 1981 by St. Martin's Press, I thought that was going to be the only book I wrote. Little did I know that books breed books. Mm-hmm. They do, and, don't they? And other books would come along. So you have, you start developing your brand and your reputation, whether it's for fiction or nonfiction, so that people will see that when you do have a new book, if they like the last book, you're much more inclined to pick up a sale from any subsequent um, offerings. And that, well, that's and you know, I think the reason that's true is that as an author, whichever genre you're writing in, you're actually creating a world. And mm-hmm. once that world exists, it calls you forward to explore it further, and mm-hmm. it calls your followers to come with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about preparing for our wonderful talk today, and I was thinking about why does it take time to develop fiction? The thing is there are many layers and levels to develop because you really are creating a world. So here are some tips. One, I would say fiction has to be unique. You have to find your own territory and then own it. And that means being ruthlessly honest with yourself, meaning has someone else really written about this and you're going to copy them? Because although it's fantastic and important to have mentors, what doesn't work is if you just try to copy what someone else has done. Readers have a nose for authenticity. And interestingly, the root of the word author and authentic Mm -hmm. is the same. So it's a really deep kind of core work you need to do with yourself. Ask yourself deeply. I mean, you could even ask yourself to dream about this. Write down on a piece of paper before you go to sleep, what do I want to write about? And see what starts to come up from your deep psyche. For me, here I was in this little town in the central coast of California. It, as unlikely, you would have thought I might write about Tokyo or New York, and, but instead, here I was writing about something else. I heard something within myself and responded to it. And then I really did do some homework. Well, nobody else is writing about that region. And so I get into the research. When I say that a certain tree is there, it's there. When I say a certain flower blooms in November, it blooms in November. I don't make mistakes about that kind of thing. You know, I really am careful because I want that sense of reality to anchor the reader. So that's that's one thing is really owning your own territory. Think about Margaret Cole, one of our favorite authors. Well, she chose the Arapaho people and has made a career of writing about that very specific region and it resonates for her and her readers, and we love to hear more about her world. Louis L'Amour, he wrote about the Old West, and he did extensive research. If he said there was a water hole, he either saw it or he talked to the guy who did. So there's that sense of reality. Okay, and another thing you need for fiction is a central theme that isn't necessarily tied to the geography, but it fits with that geography. Uh, For Louis' books, you could say, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. You know, there's some central (laughs) premise, (laughs) you know, but it rings true. Well, for me, I'm writing about the head versus the heart. Mm -hmm. So right away in book one, my character, Miranda, she's a smart person, and she's been getting quite successful as an artist in San Francisco. That's the course of her logical life. But her heart is telling her, move away, move to a tiny town, find yourself away from your family, away from your background, away from the big city. And she does it. Her parents think she's nuts. Her manager is ready to fire her. Everyone disagrees with her choice. But she's making a shift in her life to listen to her heart. That's very central to my storytelling. It's why the book is titled What the Heart Knows. Because there are big implications. If you're going to start listening to your intuition, it might make some changes in your life. And I, that interests me. So I'm, I've chosen a theme that's big and that interests me in an ongoing way. I'm not going to get bored with it. And that's important, too. 
Mm-hmm. And and you, you know the there one other character who's also important in that since I, I know all your characters I actually yep. like Sally a lot I, I like Sally's quirkiness and Sally her too. and her heart and soul but yeah. uh, uh, Miranda has a sister who is a how power executive mm-hmm. and her parents do this juxtaposition why can't you be like her Yes versus airy fairy artsy stuff. So yeah. I, I think there's a lot of good messages and it resonates and talks to the reader and, and, they, and they fall in. Um, one of my favorite sayings for an author is what you want to do is create a book that when the author opens it, they fall into it. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, and that's great. It, and, and that's what I'm looking for. That's why yeah. books get closed on page 18. Yeah. Because you didn't give them the opportunity to dive in and That's just right. immerse themselves. You're going to pro- you're going to promise them a, you know, a beautiful grotto to go swimming in. It's got to be deep enough. Yes, all, all of those things. All right, so we've got a couple of tips of really knowing it and actually I know um I love that town and actually is it Cambria. Mm-hmm. In Northern California, in Central California, I have been to it many times. And for our listeners, Cambria is it, it literally at the base of the Hearst Castle. Yeah, um, and you'll go through it, and it is a fabulous. It's an enchanting town. They have the you know from the little theater, from the quaint store. I mean, it, it's a good place to go to visit and see part of California you will never see. Yes, it's really a special area. It's because it's four hours south of San Francisco and four hours north of Los Angeles. It's just a little bit far and slightly undiscovered because of that. So mm-hmm. by the time you get there, you really feel that you're away from your usual life. And everything in this little town, it's Cambria and also San Simeon and Morro Bay and Atascadero, there's a group of little towns each of which has something very special and unique about it. I happen to love Cambria most of all, but they're all so special. And it seems almost as though it's designed to nurture the soul. There are places to walk. There are lovely shops to explore. There are wonderful places to eat. The air has a crisp snap to it. The scenery is a little bit rugged. It's um, not manicured. It's just a little bit um, undiscovered. And that makes you think and feel in a different way. All right. And so as Mara's uh, uh, describing this, and we're going to take another quick break here, but as she describes this, this is how she writes. So you, you walk down those streets with her. You can smell the air. You, you know what the sea breeze is. And that's the gift of a novelist. So for your fiction writers, you really want to have that and take it away with you. We'll be back with Marketing Strategies. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Since 1987, Color House Graphics has set the standard for quality book production. Whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run, depend on Color House to help you. You'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives. If you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing, Judith Bryles, we will provide you with discounts on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll-free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. Do you need postcards that make a statement? How about business cards, flyers, brochures, or NCR forms? Tuvets is the solution for all your printing needs. Providing services specially designed for authors, we deliver exceptional quality colored printing. Most important of all, we specialize in reducing your printing costs. No more waiting. No more standing in lines at your local printer. Online proofing. With our pricing tools calculator, you can get instant quotes on all your printing products, as well as shipping rates all over the United States. Just a few clicks of the mouse and you're on the way to discovering how easy and convenient online color printing should be. Contact our friendly, human, account representatives. We recognize that you want answers, not voice prompts. Visit our website at www.tu-vets.com or call one 800 894-8977.
Thompson Shore specializes in all books for big and small publishers. We're focused on pleasing our customers and creating beautiful, well-made books. When Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972, they believed the best employees would make up the best company. They hired people who were not just experts in bookmaking and printing, but who were obsessed with quality. We can help you create buzz for your title when it's just in its infancy with a marketing kit. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. We are books. We're flexible to meet your needs and expectations. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, you'll be in the very capable hands of our customer service team who are at the ready to answer your most pressing questions. Contact Dave Raymond at Thompson Shore. With Thompson Shore standards of excellence, you can be sure that you have the help to put your best book forward. Call 734-426-3939. That's 734-426-3939. Or visit our website at Thompson Shore. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. A few weeks ago, we had as one of our guests, Nick Zellinger, who is one of my favorite graphic designers and both for interiors as well as exteriors. I love to work with him on covers. And what we do routinely, Nick is also one of the sponsors of your guide to, to uh, book publishing. And I like to have um, every week one of our sponsors on just for a, a couple of minutes with a hot sponsor tip. So, Nick, what do we have today? Good morning, Judith. Well, I think uh, one thing that comes to mind, uh, if uh, a designer or an author and working together, if they're struggling to find uh, what are popular color combinations that will work for their covers uh, and you need a good source of inspiration, uh, I would uh, suggest you Google uh, the term uh, color palettes in, in Google and you'll get to uh, various websites that just feature color palettes and, and where the more popular color combinations sometimes uh, we get stuck with uh, what what two or three colors will work, what use will work, and uh, that's a good good source of inspiration to write online that you can see on the fly. Mm-hmm. I've always felt with with authors that that uh, I, I said so. Do you have favorite colors? Is there a color that's part of your brand? Because I think it's important, especially in the front cover, that they carry over that if it makes sense. That's correct, and and you know I'll, you'll get authors will say, well, I've read that red is the most powerful color, or or something else. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> the, the bottom line is that it's uh, a, colors like anything in fashion are kind of trendy. You can obviously just going online, you'll see what the latest color combination, popular colors are. But uh, that'll also give you a great idea of what colors pop and what work. Because a lot of times the first time you'll see a cover will be online. So uh, those those color uh pairings will uh you know really uh make a big impression uh so i think that's a good source of information well and and i guess we need to also tell our our listeners that what you see on your computer screen may not be exactly what you get very true everybody's monitor has a different color saturation and the print industry uh is printing on uh uh, obviously, paper and ink is different, so uh, what you see on the screen is obviously going to be a lot more luminous and bright, uh, so you need to take that in consideration. Always get proofs of your work so that you can kind of see it in your hands, too. Excellent. All right, Nick, how do people get a hold of you? It is uh, www.nzgraphics.com, or you can call me at 303-985-4174. Thank you so much for your tip for the day. Thank you, Judith. Okay. All right. We're back with Mara, and we have talked about some of her background of what she did with the creation of her book series that she started, ended up starting uh, where she thought she was going down a path with Random House and signing a wonderful contract, and then the mergers all started, and so she pulled it away, and she created Milford Haven 
press, which has done fairly well, and now she's gone on another path and another journey, which she's going to share with you during this half hour as her series and her following and her crowd, the tribe, has expanded. So Mara Pearl, author of What the Heart Knows, is back with us. Where do Thanks, we go? Judith. So, yeah, where do we go, Mara, from here? <laughs> well, um, here's the thing. I, I, marketing fiction, I honestly, as much as I adore talking and sharing information about creating fiction, I have an equal passion for marketing it. Um, it's funny. Uh, you hear this constant refrain that fiction is hard. Uh, well, I think fiction is hard anything to worthwhile is hard. I don't really believe fiction is harder than anything else. Uh, I think that, honestly, what I've discovered through the years is the most dynamic way to approach marketing fiction is to treat it as though it's nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And by that, what I mean is it is about something. Well, you have to understand exactly what it's about. So we were talking about depth and how important that is in fiction. You really have to understand a little more deeply. If somebody asks, what are your novels about, you can't just say, they're fun. It's not deep enough. You can't just say, "Mm, they're historic. It doesn't give enough information. It's, the novel is beyond its setting and its situation. It's really about something, and you need to find out what that something is because that will be your magnet with which you will f- attract your followers. So what I worked on was if I had a nonfiction book, and, you know, Aaron Gray and I wrote a nonfiction book that did very mm-hmm. well called Act Right. Mm-hmm. And it was a very, very niche book. It was for actors, advice for actors. So the premise from which we worked was, how could we be of service to our readers? Well, I carried that idea forward when I started the novels. How can I be of service to my readers? Well, are you really being of service to a reader when you offer them a, a novel? Yes, I passionately will answer yes. And for some novels, it's escape. And escapism can be valuable in this high-stress world. For some novels, it's making your life better. For me, this head and heart theme became very important. I would start to ask readers, and I used my book festivals and other events to teach myself how to connect with my readers, and I really recommend this as a process. I found my talking points. I would find when did a reader's eyes come right to mine and make the connection. Well, for me, it was when I began asking them the question, in your heart of hearts, what did you always want to do with your life, and are you doing it yet? Wow, what a powerful way of connecting. And well, that's and, the core, really the core of my whole message with my novels. Uh-huh. And, and you know, when you're in your heart of hearts, what do you really want to do with your life? Exactly. Is not that, that the perfect topic for many nonfiction books? Of course you it is. And it what is, you, yes. What, you, yes. what your path is, yes. what, what your mojo is, all those things. Yes. So, I, and I think what you have done, um, and, and I've uh, been a great admirer of it, watching you... Uh, develop it, is that so many fiction authors are um, almost fearful. Um, A a lot of times, you know, they're not extroverts, and they're fearful of getting out and meeting the public. And the the bottom line is, that's who you're writing for. So how can you write as well as you want to and develop what you want to with it unless you get out and find out what they want to hear? I so agree with you. Uh, it's sometimes it, it isn't the easiest thing. It may feel easier to be locked in your ivory tower and you don't have to be uh, in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. But it really isn't about me being in the spotlight. What I find is when I am standing up in front of people and talking to them, um, my heart is listening to them. My heart is saying, I'm interested in you. I'm interested in your path. What can I share of my experience that will illuminate something for you? Sometimes it's a funny story. Sometimes it's one of those aha moments. 
those are the things that I love to share. And Mm -hmm. in today's marketing of fiction, I would say that the most important thing is developing your own following. And what that implies is you need to give them a great message to begin with, and you need to be able to continue that great message so that there's more and more and more that they enjoy hearing, they enjoy being reminded of that world because it brings them into a place that they find they like their own thoughts, they like their own sense of progress. All right, so with, with that statement, this, we're, we're, we have a couple of minutes before we go to our final break, and then we'll you know, have the, the final 12 minutes. What I'd like to do is talk about some specific marketing strategies that worked, and maybe a few that were hiccups that didn't work. Okay. Well, when I was accepted by my new publisher, um, I was asked to blog, and I was horrified at first because I thought, how am I going to write the books and also blog? But they asked, and I thought, okay, I'm going to step up. Well, what I realized immediately, I can't write a blog about I myself, me, I'm so great, buy my book. I mean, how often would you read an email like that? You know, (laughs) never. Delete. (laughs) So it has to be about something. And I thought, okay, I'm writing about head and heart. What about if I write a blog where I look at any and every issue in life from the perspective of the head and the heart? It has become uh, something, a great discipline for me that has helped me understand my own writing even better. It means that I have become trustworthy as a writer, meaning people can tune into my blog and it will always actually be about something. That means they can trust me. Oh, she's not going to just be flogging her book. She's not going to be writing about just something idiotic. She's going to be writing about something. That has greatly increased my readership. Uh, We then took it up a notch and did an actual blog tour. I worked with a great team and did a one-month blog tour. It was a lot of work. I worked eight to ten hours a day. So on each blog where I was a guest, I had to provide some kind of a contribution, an essay of some sort. I did a lot of writing. It was very interesting to write specifically for each of these different audiences and provide content that would be meaningful for them in their journey. All right. And, and, you know, I think that that's what really got my attention when I started following you on your blog tour, because you did really tie in specifically. And when we come back, I want you to identify a couple of the ones that you went to. And, and also, let's tell the audience just how many people you reached with that, okay. because it's pretty exciting <laughs> what exciting. you got out there. And in that, it, 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 folks, it wasn't 5,000 or 10,000. We're talking a lot. It was a little more. Yeah. Yeah, a little more. All right. <laughs> We'll be right back. This is Judith Bryles, and you're listening to Your Guide to Book Publishing. This is Your Guide to Book Publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems, you want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd if you want to create a book with no regrets. Give her a call today, 303 885-2207. That's 303-885-2207. Or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at MyBookShepherd and on Facebook at TheBookShepherd.
At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types, including side sewing. We provide warehousing, kitting, distribution, inventory, management, a new print-on-demand facility, streaming browser-based ebooks, and bookstore. Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And with me is my very special guest, Mara Pearl, who is the author of What the Heart Knows, that I will tell everyone you can go to any bookstore, and if they have sold out their copies, um, all you have to do is say, get me one, and they will they can quickly order it in. It's available at all the warehouses and distribution centers, or you can go to the cyber store in the sky, Amazon or BNN.com, and order it directly from there. All right, Mara, in this last segment, what I'd like to do is continue with some of those marketing tips. I want you to get into the dynamics of the uh, virtual book tour that you did. And also, I don't want to leave here without talking about the value of uh, working with bookstores as well as libraries. Oh, good. Yes, that's very important. So the blog tour, this was a new experience for me, and I've heard authors say they like the blog tour because they don't have to go anywhere. They can just be in their jammies in their office, and it's easy. That was not my experience, and I also wasn't in my jammies because I like to be fully present uh, in the sense of I'm connecting with people and I'm inviting them into my world. So I dressed appropriately. <laughs> Um, the blog tour was challenging. Uh, for example, one of the host sites was called The Lady Killers, and this is a fabulous website run by eight mystery writers. They are very experienced, and they're tough. They are not interested in having a blog that they've done before. It had to be original and something that really piqued their interest. So you have to audition, basically, to be on their site. Well, what I came up with for them was a short piece about when a smart character does something stupid. Well, they loved that idea. And my short essay sparked a blog tour within the blog tour, meaning they liked the topic themselves. They each also wrote about it. So instead of my one posting, there were now nine postings on that subject. Then their followers, and they have hundreds of thousands of followers, also got interested and started commenting on these posts. So it, it became a little magnet, you know, it pulled interest into this specific topic. And it's of particular interest to writers, but then again, it's of interest to a reader because you look at yourself and you say, well, when was the last time I did something stupid and I'm a smart person? So it's an interesting foible in human nature that we wrote about. That was a very sort of intuitive and logical thing for me to do. It fit very well with my whole endeavor. But then I was invited to do a post on a very different kind of website that was harder for me. And this one is called Art Biz Blog. And yes. again, hundreds of thousands of followers, very, very successful blog run by Allison Stanfield, who's just a genius at what she does. She helps artists, that is, fine artists, painters, figure out how to market their work. Well, 
I'm not a painter, but my protagonist is. So I've done a lot of research in the world of fine art. So we talked, and Allison said, well, theoretically, I like the idea, but you're going to have to prove to me that you can provide something that's really of value for my followers. Well, uh, a little bit too sure of myself, I said, of course I can do that. So I wrote (laughs) a brilliant essay, and she said, nope, sorry, not interested. And I was like, really? So I wrote another essay, which was even more brilliant, and she said, nope, sorry, not interested. I was really scratching my head and getting a little annoyed about this. And I thought, okay, wait, let me think about Allison's world and the world of her followers and what she needs. Instead of thinking about what I want to write, let me instead think about how I can be of service to her and her followers. Looked at her website again for the tenth time, and what I realized was, duh, it's not a narrative website. It's a visual, graphic website. They need bullet points, not essays. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly got it. Well, I came up with the 10 Bs, that B-E, apostrophe S, of the art business. And it was wonderful. I enjoyed coming up with it and really thinking about it. Well, what do you know? It became one of the hit posts on her blog site. We got responses from people saying, I'm keeping this on my iPhone. I'm sticking it on my refrigerator. I've posted it on my computer screen. It, it, you know, it became something very useful, and I learned a great lesson uh, that it's really about not about me. It's about how can I help someone else. And you know what you've just said is so critical to our listeners and our authors because it is about someone else and it's what they take away. So whether it's a nonfiction, you're trying to solve a problem, you're trying to ease or, or, or eliminate their pain, you're trying to give them solutions. That's what how-to books primarily do. Mm-hmm. For fiction, it's entertaining, it's carrying them on a journey, it's it's enveloping them with, with the protagonist having a problem that's caused by something that's looking for some kind of a solution. I mean, they're all connected. They are connected. And the thing is, when you read my novels, you can read it at whichever level you choose. You can sit there and just go, oh, goody, I'm going to go away to the Central Coast and I don't even have to get on an airplane and just go away and have this lovely escapism. On the other hand, you can read it more deeply and say, well, here are characters. Which ones do I resonate with? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Samantha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I see what she's doing. I did that. Mm -hmm. So you may Mm -hmm. recognize something in yourself that becomes useful. Exactly. And, and it, you know, it's always a challenge for me, Mara, in reading, especially some of the National Book Award winners, I can't stand them. And that uh, for, for someone who reads, I read at least 100 books a year, wow. and with, whether with clients or once in a while I get to my gift to myself after I finish one of my own books, that writing my own books, and I've written 28, is that I get a month of not reading nonfiction for pleasure, you know, for business, mm-hmm. business. I get to read what I call trashy novels, and which for, for me is in the women's fiction line, which is what your expertise is, mm-hmm. um, and um, or, or thrillers. I like thrillers. So I have to find something that, that will connect me with it. And what I find with so many, they're, they're, they're really well-written, but their characters are, oh, my God, I can't stand them. Why would I want to spend <laughs> mega hours t- tumbling through 400 Six hundred pages of of reading about another screwed up family um, or person who just can't get their act together. At some point, I it's, it's I close it at page eighteen. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, in other words, we it's fine to have problems, but we really want characters who face them and exactly. deal with things connect. and get on with it. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. so we have just a few minutes left. So we, you did this incredible blog tour, and I want to tell our listeners, if you want to know something about Allison Stanfield's very visual, it's artbizcoach.com. Uh, she, run, she runs one of the best blogs out there, and I would encourage you just for an example, if not anything else, to see what she's up to. Oh, yes, right. she's fantastic. Yeah, all right. So with that said, um, how many people did we reach? Well, At the end of the tour, we thought, well, for fun, you know, we'll just add it up. 17 million followers. 17 million followers. And here's the interesting thing. Years ago, I was on the Today Show, and I think 
I reach 35 million. It's not that I reach them, but the Today Show reaches 35 million for their audience. So, of course, that was very thrilling. However, you could say that a general interest show like that, that's kind of scattershot. So of those 35 million, how many were actually interested in what I was talking about? Maybe a small fraction. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this blog tour, that is 17 million people who specifically have an interest in women's fiction who found something of interest in my novels. So yeah, those that, are really, that's hard data. That's pretty bloody exciting. And yeah. what, what you're showing is that for our authors, and especially fiction, which is what we're talking about this hour, is to, you got to be targeted. And whether it's for your writing, you target for who that writing is. And I've always said the more you niche yourself, the bigger your market becomes. And that you, you go that direction, you write to them to connect. But also when you're marketing, you go exactly like that. You reach out in that area where those people are coming coming and gathering. The internet for fiction is, my gosh, an author's best friend. But you got to do your homework and know really where to do. go with it. <clears throat> yes, yes. You're right. It's a narrow entryway, and once you get into it, it expands and expands. It's very exciting, infinite possibilities. Yeah. In our last minute with you, Mara, what kind of little tidbits or big tidbits would you like to leave our listeners with? I, I want to say that distribution is huge, and this may be in particularly important for fiction. I am so blessed now to be with a, a new publishing company for women's fiction called Bell Keep Books, but the most important thing about Bell Keep is its partnership with Midpoint Trade. I have mm -hmm. respected Midpoint for so many years, and for me to be working with them is a huge dream come true. They understand each aspect of distribution. They have relationships and conversations with the people at the distribution companies, the chain bookstores, the indie bookstores, the libraries, and each of these is a world unto itself that needs to be respected. Libraries in our country are suffering uh, with the downturn in the economy, which happily is finally starting to turn around, mm -hmm. but libraries provide a uh, huge engine of creativity and inspiration in every possible way. Oh, great. Oh, Mara, we're going to have to do a wrap-up here. So, thank, thank you, you so much. I just have loved talking with you. Great. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. Lovely. All right. Thanks for being with me today, everyone. I want to let you know next week we're going to be focusing on the author and book platform, and I'm going to spend the first half as the guest of the guest really probing and showing you how to do it. And then joining me the second half hour is Dr. Lynn Hillerstein, who created See It, Say It, Do It. And her first book signing, listen to this, sold 900 books. How's that sound when the average author sells a total of 500 during the life of the book. You're going to learn how she did it. We'll see you next week. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryle.